Hi everybody. Very good evening and welcome back to yet another engaging session and a very important topic. Uh, so today's webinar is actually on inhalational therapy again and uh, uh, we are here presenting to you a lot more discussion about inhalational therapy and we have some very uh, prominent promising young dynamic very intellectual panel with us and i'm very happy to introduce them so we have dr praveen tavre from mumbai dr tavre is md from km hospital he is edarm he is dpsm uh, he is currently the chest consultant and interventional pulmonologist and sleep specialist at glenagles uh, hospital parel in mumbai thank you dr praveen and welcome to the webinar thank you ma'am Dr. Deepthi Hassan. Dr. Deepthi is currently the assistant professor, Hassan Institute of Medical Sciences. She is also the National TB Elimination Program Nodal Officer since the last seven years. She has a lot of publications. She has even written a chapter in the book of respiratory emergencies for postgraduates. She has been a speaker and a very prominent faculty in a lot of national conferences across. Uh, and then, last but not the least, very. Uh, Yet another dynamic uh, practitioner from another part of India, which is Lucknow. We have Dr. Ravi Bhaskar. Dr. Ravi Bhaskar is also a senior pulmonologist practicing currently in Lucknow. He has his own flourishing uh, and I think flourished uh, practice from Lucknow. So with that, we will go to today's program. We have two talks today, one from Dr. Deepthi and the second from Dr. Praveen, Dr. Deepthi is talking about uh, inhalational therapy, the basic principles, and Dr. Praveen would be talking about uh, the basic principles of nebulized therapy. So with that, I welcome Dr. Deepthi to please begin her talk. A good, good evening to one and all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shivani, for that kind introduction. Um, and particularly, thank you to Dr. Krishna and CCI team for giving me this opportunity. So let me begin with the essential concepts of inhalational therapy. Uh, we'll be covering the basics uh, with the meter dose inhalers, dry powder inhalers, and breath actuated inhalers. So why inhalational therapy? Because deposition of the drug directly at the local site causes faster onset of action there is lower dose of medication required and there is enhanced safety with very less side effects. So as you can see, using inhalational route will act in six, uh, within seconds to minutes and it reaches the lung directly. Whereas any other route will act in minutes to hours and it reaches all undesired sites causing a lot of side effects. So here you can see the amount of the dose required in inhalation, which is only 600 mcg, whereas in oral it is up to 6000. So inhalational route reduces the dose required. So what are your systems available? We have meter dose inhaler with an add-on device of spacer or a mask, a dry powder inhaler, nebulizer, and breath actuated meter dose inhalers. So the nebulizer part will be covered by Dr. Praveen. The mechanism of aerosol deposition begins with an inertial impaction where the larger particles, which are more than five micron, get impacted into the oropharyngeal wall. It is the ones which, which are below five microns that reaches the lung. And in that also, it is only the ones below uh, one microgram, even 0.5 microgram, according to some articles, which actually diffuse into the system. So as you can see, it's only 20% which is actually deposited in the lung, 80% is swallowed and the rest goes into the systemic circulation and it is excreted via urine. So what are the factors that actually uh, affect drug delivery? So apart from the particle size of the formulation, which we have already discussed, it is the nature of the device, the technique of the uh, use. That is the patient should know how to use the device and also the pattern of breathing, which is important, which differs from each device we'll be discussing in the coming uh, slides. So not all devices are apt for all patients. Why? Because each device performs differently and there is a need to master these techniques. And that is also important because we have noticed with the study that the number of mistakes in an inhalation technique as it increases, the asthma control worsens. So more incorrect the technique, more uncontrolled is the disease. 
even the change in FEV1, you can notice that with a good technique, there is an improvement in lung function. Even Gina has recognized the importance of a correct inhaler technique. There are four C's. You have to choose the right device for the right patient. You have to check the technique. You have to correct any uh, mistakes and further confirm with every follow-up whether the technique is being done properly. And same goes for gold. It also recommends the assessment and regular evaluation of the inhaler technique. So an age-wise selection of devices, less than four years, you have to go for an MDI with spacer and a face mask. Up to five years, you can go for a, a, a MDI with spacer, a no uh, face mask. And above five years, you can even opt for a dry powder inhaler. Any other uh, option, which is, if these are not working, you have to go for a nebulizer. So beginning with the pressurized meter dose inhalers, those are the parts of the uh, MDI. You have a container, you have a propellant. Nowadays, uh, it is a hydrofluoroalkane, which is a very environment-friendly propellant. Drug formulation, actuator, and the metering valve. So what really happens when the patient presses the can, which opens the channel between the metering chamber and the atmosphere, the propellants start to boil in the expansion chamber. There are shearing forces, which leads to the propellant droplets that form at the nozzle. And then later, you have the drug that comes out with an initial velocity of 30 meters per second and a droplet size of up to 30 microns. Later, there is an evaporation and cooling. And that is what is called as cold freon effect. That is, the patient feels a sudden cold effect, which causes cough and bronchospasm. So that is one of the uh, negative uh, points about an MDI. So as you can see in the picture, when there is an aerosol plume, there are the larger particles which get impacted and the ones below five microns that reaches the airway. So what is the importance of complete exhalation prior to actuation? Before the patient actuates the device, it is important for him to have a complete exhalation. As you can see, an incomplete exhalation will lead to only a deposition in the large airways. Whereas the complete exhalation, as you can see, will cause a complete deep uh, uh, deposition in the lung. So what breathing pattern would you advise for a patient using a MDI? It is slow and deep breathing. So you begin with a slow inhalation, you press the canister, and at the same time, try to maintain the slow and deep inhalation so that you acquire a better de deposition in the lung with minimum deposition in the airway. And that is the right position to hold the inhaler, not the other way around. So the advantages of an MDI, it is small size, multiple doses, less expensive, there is consistent dosing, it is independent of inspiratory flow, and it is protected from moisture and pathogens. But its limitations are it is difficult to coordinate. The patient should be able to do so, otherwise with a bad technique, sometimes no drug is deposited at all. There is a lot of chance for an oropharyngeal deposition, and as I've already mentioned, the cold freon effect. So that is why there are spacers. So with the help of them, you can hold the medication for a few seconds in the spacer after it has been released from the MDI. So what ha happens when the MDI is actuated, there is an aerosol cloud which is produced. And in the spacer device, there is an evaporation of the propellant and the settling of the large particles. So it is only the finer particles which are slow moving, which move towards the mouthpiece. And then that increases the amount of drug that is actually reaching the lower airways and limits the one that is uh, deposited in the mouth. That is the aerosol cloud. So it makes the use of MDI easier, that is reduces the deposition in the oropharynx, improves lung deposition. So it's a good alternative to nebulizers, particularly in acute situations. So in situations of exacerbation where it is not, a nebulizer is not available, we can go for repeated single actuations using a spacer. So who are the ones who should be using spacers? Those with coordination problems, particularly children, elderly, those who are prescribed very high-dose inhaled steroids, high-dose bronchodilators, and anticholinergic drugs that need to avoid the spray particle from reaching the eyes. So what are the factors which affect the dose delivery through a spacer? It is chamber device uh, size, chamber shape, the construction material, electrostatic charge inside the spacer, resistance of the valve, use of multiple actuations and any inhalation delay, because that will only lead to more deposition in the spacer rather than in the mouth. 
So a non-static spacer will improve lung deposition. So as you can see in this picture, spacer deposition leads to more, a uh, static uh, uh, device leads to more spacer deposition rather than lung. Whereas in non-static, we can see a better lung deposition is seen. Coming to dry powder inhalers, it is basically a micronized drug with some carrier particle, which is used usually lactose. And what we have to understand here is a device resistance. That is, a DPI formulation is deaggregated by a turbulent energy which is generated by the patient's uh, inhalation. So th this energy is produced by the patient's uh, inhalation flow as well as the device resistance. So a low resistant device improves the flow. So these are the dry powders uh, inhalers which are available. We have the unit dose DPI and the multi-dose DPI. The unit dose, we have rotahaler, revolizer, loop inhaler, uh, backhaler. And in the multi-dose, we have the sip inhaler and the turbo inhalers. So the unit, unit dose means only a single capsule can be loaded, whereas multi-dose means you have multiple doses and there is no need to load. So even that affects the affordability. Whereas in a multi haler there are multiple doses, but each dose is individually packed. Whereas in a turbo haler you have all doses and they're all packed together. So it is very highly sensitive to moisture. So in a DPI, the breathing pattern is quite different from an MDI. Here we have to go ask them to do a fast and a deep breathing. So inhale rapidly and deeply until the lungs are full. So that is important because only then you get the in inhalation flow that can deaggregate the molecule, as you can see in the picture, and the drug particle is actually released. So the error is they fail to exhale before inhale inhaling, they fail to forcefully and deeply inhale, and they fail to hold the breath after inhalation, which is important for all the inhale inhaler devices. So advantages are it is simple to teach, there is little coordination required, Multiple drugs can be administered from the same device. Dose counters are available for multi-dose DPIs. It is environment friendly and there is no need of spacers. Whereas disadvantages, it is dependent on the patient's inspiratory airflow. The pr a process of inhalation has to be repeated till the capsule is empty. There is also a possible problem of uniformity, dose uniformity. It requires frequent cleaning and there is also a vulnerability to clumping. So we will be discussing rota haler, ribolizer, and multi-dose DPI in detail in the uh, slide that uh, demonstrates the use. So coming to breath-actuated inhalers, here the inhaler will sense the patient's inhalation through the actuator, and then automatically it will release the drug. So here it overcomes the problem of coordination, and that is advantage of both MDI and DPI. So as you can see, the advantage of DPI, as it is seen, it, it's, it's a dome shape and there is a dust cap and all you have to do is actuate uh, with breath. And the advantage of MDI is it's a small orifice, so a very fine particle dose will be released. So a good deposition is seen with a uh, breath actuated device and it even improves asthma control because there is reduced usage of additional medications. Even the patients are preferring a breath actuated device. So when you even evaluate all your available options, it is easy to use, easy to learn, time consumed is less, the need to prepare the device is not there, it can be used by all age and severity, and very little maintenance is required for a breath actuated one. So the best inhalation practice is an equation for a better outcome. What is it? The equation is choose the right inhaler. Ensure that the correct technique is done. Regular cleaning and maintenance of device has to be taught. Consuming the right recommended number of doses and ultimately it leads to the best outcome. And how do you select? If the patient is having conscious inhalation, uh, if, if they are not having inhalation, you can go for an MDI with spacer or a nebulizer. If conscious inhalation is possible and there is a good inspiratory flow with a hand breath coordination, we can go for an MDI, DPI, a breath actuated one. If there is no hand breath coordination, then you have to use a spacer. If there is an insufficient flow, patient is not having a good flow, but a good coordination, you can still go for an MDI or a breath actuated with spacer, with or without spacer, depending on the coordination. And if there is no coordination, again, we go back to a MDI with spacer and an, or even a nebulizer. So here are a few wrong techniques which were noticed. Number one, as you can see, using MDI through nasal cavity. Here, they are holding the device away from the mouth, so a lot of drug is lost already. 
directly swallowing the capsules orally, which is of no use. And here the DPI device is full of used capsules. So let me summarize. The MDI is what is most widely used. The formulation is protected from environmental contamination, but most patients fail to coordinate the actuation and inhalation. That is why there are add-on devices like spacers and masks, which help to deliver the drug to young infants and children, but they are bulky and the adherence is the issue. DPIs overcome the coordination problem. There are no propellants and it is easy to learn, but it is again inspiratory effort dependent and susceptible to humidity. That is where the breath actuated inhaler comes in, which overcomes the coordination issue. It can work at very low inspiratory flow rates, easy to teach and learn. Thank you. Good evening all, myself Dr. Praveen. Thank you very much for CCI for giving me the opportunity. Thank you Dr. Shivani and thank you Dr. Dipti Krishnan for elaborative talk on inhalational techniques. So my job is very easy. Now I'm going to talk on essential concepts of nebulization therapy. So I'll be covering the following objectives, the introduction, mechanism of nebulization therapy, what are the types, disadvantages, indications, and nebulization in ICU patients and post-nebulization care. Nebulization is a process of dispersing a liquid solution into the microscopic particles and delivering into the lungs as patient inhales through the nebulizers. And what are the aerosols? A relatively stable suspension of liquid droplets or a solid particles in a gaseous medium. And aim is to deliver a therapeutic and optimum dose to the desired site of action. So, uh, as you see in this picture, a pressurized air source is used, which is, uh, which is used in a jet nebulizer. So, aerosols are generated by passing a pressurized gas at a high velocity uh, through a small jet orifice. And we need to know few uh, terms, which are fill volumes, the amount of drug solution or suspension filled in the nebulizer reservoir chamber, volume output, the what uh, the volume of solution leaving the nebulizer chamber, and the residual volume, the volume of the liquid remaining in the nebulizer reservoir when nebulization is completed. And driving gas, here in uh, a jet nebulizer, we mostly use a pressurized air. Sometimes you can use oxygen as a, a driving gas. So what are the advantages of nebulization therapy? You can deliver high drug of concentration directly to the disease site, minimizes the risk of systemic side effect, a fast clinical response. You can bypass the barrier to the therapeutic efficacy, achieve a similar or superior therapeutic effect at the, at the lower systemic dose and minimal coordination is required by the patient and you can uh, do a dose modification and you can use multiple medication at the same time. What are the disadvantages? Disadvantage being a time consuming process, which takes around 5 to 10 minutes, a false sense of security. Uh, it is costly, needs pressurized gas source or other power source, potential for drug delivery to eyes and it can lead to contamination and nosocomial, nosocomial infection. What are the types of nebulizers? Jet nebulizer, which is most commonly used, ultrasonic nebulizer and vibratic mesh nebulizer. Uh, ultrasonic nebulizers further classified into two types, a small volume nebulizers and large volume nebulizers. So as we already discussed in, uh, in the jet nebulizer, aerosols are generated by passing pressurized gas at a high velocity through a small jet orifice. It works on a Venturi principle and it requires around 8 to 10 liters of pressurized air. And it is mainly used for short-acting beta agonist and corticosteroids. What are uh, what are different types of jet nebulizers? Jet nebulizer with corrugated tube, with uh, collection bag, which acts as a reservoir, breath-enhanced jet nebulizers, and breath-actuated jet nebulizers. So, what are breath-actuated uh, nebulizers? Uh, so, these nebulizers only gives you the drug when you inhale. So, it works only on inspiration and there will be decreased treatment time and reduced occupational exposure. What are ultrasonic nebulizers? They, they use a piezoelectric crystal for nebulization and crystal vibrates in a frequency of 1 to 3 megahertz when electric current is passed. And nebulization occurs as a result of ultrasound, ultrasonic energy being transduced to the solution. But it can lead to a rise in temperature and should be avoided to the heat labile drugs. The frequency of ultrasonic waves, uh, waves is inversely 
proportional to the particle size of the aerosols and amplitude of the crystal vibration uh, is directly proportional to the drug output. Uh, the factors affecting ultrasonic nebulizers are uh, uh, various factors can lead to uh, can affect the ultrasonic nebulizations like viscosity of the liquid, high density of the liquid, surface tension, vibration amplitude and vibration frequency and the size of nebulizer. So you need a large residual volumes in ultrasonic uh, nebulizers and should be should not be used in suspension and proteins. Next type is vibrating mesh nebulizer. It uses ultrasonic waves. It it has a mesh at the top with a thousand laser uh, a thousands of uh, laser drilled aperture vibrating at the top and that vibration leads to push and pull motion of the mesh and can uh, and leads to aerolization. So, what are the advantages of mesh ne uh, nebulizers? It is two to, two to three times higher lung deposition, short treatment time, and low residual volume and silent. Disadvantages being you cannot use for a very viscous liquids and you cannot aerolize a crystal uh, uh, aerolize the drugs that crystallize on drying and cleaning cleaning will be a little difficult. So, which nebulizers for which drugs? Mostly jet nebulizers we use for short acting beta agonists, short acting muscarinic agents and corticosteroids and breath enhanced nebulizers for different antibiotics like tobramycin and cholestimethate sodium and mesh nebulizers for liposomal formulations and different antibiotics and mucolytics. So which interface to use? Mouthpiece and face mask are most commonly used uh, interfaces. Pacifier mask for neonates and infants and children when mouthpiece cannot be used or face mask cannot be used. TP is mainly in a ventilated patients, nasal mask in neonates and children and hood, but mostly try to avoid uh, using hood as it causes facial and ocular deposition of the drug. When you use different kinds of interfaces, ensure a good seal and avoid face mask when administering corticosteroids and anticholinergic agent to the glaucoma patient. But face mask is easy for the patient, but it can lead to deposition of drug in nasal passage and over the face. Where you can nebulize the patient? You can nebulize at home, in wards, in ICU and uh, in emergency department or in ambulance as well. What are the most common uh, indications? Obstructive airway disease. When patients are unable to, handheld, uh, unable to use handheld devices due to altered physical and mental status, patients with a poor hand-breath coordination, acute exacerbation of obstructive airway disease and obstructive airway disease with severe airflow limitations and mucolytics in cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis and COPD patients. And when um, when you, uh, when patient is uh, unable to produce sputum, that time you can use for induction of the sputum and you can use uh, antibiotic, inhaled antibiotic, uh, especially in cystic fibrosis and a ventilatory associated pneumonia and bacterial colonization. Nebulization in ICU patient, Nebulization in ICU patient depends on so many factors, a drug related factor, mechanical ventilation related factors, device factor and patient related factors. So when you see a mechanical ventilated patient, ventilator parameters are very important. Most commonly when you are giving nebulizer, try to give volume assisted mode. Uh, or vol uh, the, the inspiratory flow should be around 30 to 50 liters. A duty cycle should be around 0.3 to 0.5. Uh, PEEP should be around 5, tidal volume should be more than around 500 ml if feasible or if possible. Try to use larger airways, larger endotracheal tube and tracheostomy. And when tracheostomy is used, use TPs as interface. Uh, remove humidifier before uh, starting nebulization. And when you uh, nebulize the non-ventilated, uh, non, uh, uh, non-invasive ventilated patient, uh, tell patient to take slow and deep breathing and uh, uh, when you are using aqueous solutions, use uh, vibratory mesh nebulizers. Position of the nebulizer in ventilatory circuit is very important. As you see, three position in uh, in this picture. A position one is in between endotracheal tube and Y tube. A position two is just fifteen centimeter uh, from the Y, and uh, a position three is fifteen centimeter from the ventilator side. So, so whatever extra tubing. Uh, will act as a spacer or re a reservoir which will lead to a better aerosol bolus delivery. So continuous versus intermittent nebulization when you use uh, in a mechanical ventilated patient 
can be uh, it can be given continuously or intermittently but intermittent nebulization when you specially use uh, uh, antibiotic is more efficient than a continuous nebulization that minimizes the aerosol loss during exhalation and post nebulization care is very important cleaning and maintenance of the nebulizer is uh, is utmost important and paramedics should know the post um, nebulization good clinical practice and failure to that can cause nosocomial pneumonia so regular cleaning and disinfection of the reusable respiratory accessories is very essential to prevent risk of possible nosocomial infection as you see in this uh, study done in 2013 a fungal colonization has gone down from 75% to 15% and from 18 uh, the bacterial colonization from 87 to 12% so to summarize uh, uh, the nebulization therapy most commonly used in icu you can use at home and when patient is having a severe obstruction and uh, most commonly used uh, nebulizer will be jet nebulizer and easily available uh, and a cleaning is very important when you do nebulization uh, be it at home be it at uh, icu you need to avoid nosocomial infection when you use when you do nebulization therapy thank you thank you dr deepthi and dr praveen for such illustrative talks i am sure that you know it's made our task of the panel discussion very easy so uh, i mean i must mention here that this topic actually is a brainchild of dr nh krishna sir the founder president of uh, cci sir has uh, actually been looking for innovative topics and i think it is a record in itself that cci actually hasn't repeated a single topic in over 4 years of coming up with webinars every thursday every week and however still no repetition of uh, topic in respiratory medicine so i think that itself is actually a huge accomplishment however this topic per se is extremely important i would feel for pulmonologist physicians internist everybody so i am very thankful to sir to come up with this topic and sir was very insistent that since we are talking about inhalational technique it would be incomplete if we do not talk about the correct inhalational techniques so really wanted you know videos to go out through this platform about correct inhalational techniques for which our uh, partners here today sipla and specially vipul ji actually has gone out of his way to make videos for the demonstration of the correct inhalational techniques and we would now play uh, all the videos of these uh, devices so what we are covering today is a revolizer a pmdi a zero stat vt a half puff kit and the nebulizer about how they are used and then dr praveen very kindly consented to uh, demonstrate the use of elipta inhalers for us so this is the sequence of uh, device demonstration that we would follow so we'll first begin with the uh, video demonstration followed by the panel discussion let's understand how to use a revolizer It's an easy to use inhaler device. Just remember these easy steps. Open, insert, close and inhale. The revolizer has three main parts: a mouthpiece, a rotor cap chamber, and a base. Start by holding a revolizer at its base and open the mouthpiece until you see the two arrows meet. Take a rotor cap and insert it into a rotor cap chamber. Make sure the transparent end of the rotor cap is facing downwards. Close the mouthpiece until you hear the click sound. You can use the revolizer while sitting or standing, but make sure to keep your head straight. Breathe out completely. Put the mouthpiece between your teeth and close your lips around it, but don't bite it. Inhale through your mouth. as fast and deep as you can if you're doing it right you would hear the rotor cap moving inside the revolizer remove the revolizer from your mouth hold your breath just for 10 seconds or as long as you are comfortable then breathe out normally after taking each dose rinse your mouth with water and spit it out 
If there's a powder left in the rotocap chamber, repeat the above steps and take a second inhalation. After each use, open the mouthpiece until the two arrows meet and throw away the empty rotocap. Close the mouthpiece and put the revelizer in the pouch for better hygiene. Wasn't it easy to use a revelizer? Just remember the easy steps and you're good to go. Open, insert, close, inhale. Here are some important instructions. Clean the revelizer at least once a week to ensure smooth functioning. Rinse the mouthpiece and rotocap chamber under clean running water and allow them to air dry. It is recommended to use a new revelizer after every six months. For more information on product, refer pack insert or log on to breathefree.com. Or you can call on 987 333 Want to know how to use a PMDI? Pressurized meter dose inhaler. Let's see how to use PMDI correctly. Just remember these three steps. Step one, open and shake. Step two, breathe out. Step three, press and inhale. Let's understand parts of the inhaler. The PMDI has four main parts. A mouthpiece, mouthpiece cap, dose counter and a canister. Now if you're using the inhaler for the first time or haven't used it for more than a week, you need to prime your inhaler. But how do you prime the inhaler? <laughs> Remove the cap from the mouthpiece, give the inhaler a good shake, then press the canister twice to release two puffs into the air. Voila! Your inhaler is ready to use. Let me demonstrate steps for using PMDI. Step 1. Sit or stand upright. Open the mouthpiece cap and give the inhaler a good shake. Step 2. Breathe out completely. Then put the mouthpiece in your mouth between your teeth. Close your lips tightly around it. Make sure you don't bite it. Step 3. Start breathing slowly and deep. While you are doing that, press the canister to release one spray of a medicine and continue to breathe slowly and deeply. Then take the mouthpiece out of your mouth and hold your breath just for 10 seconds or as long as you are comfortable. Then breathe out, close the mouthpiece cap. Important instructions. Always remember to rinse your mouth with water after inhalation and spit it out. Make sure you don't swallow it. Consult your doctor for frequency and use. Now you have learned how to use this PMDI correctly. Just remember three steps. Step one, open and shake. Step two, breathe out. Step three, press and inhale. Here are some important things to remember while using PMDI. PMDI comes with a dose counter which explains how many doses are remaining. It counts each dose but it moves at an interval of 20 doses. When the last 40 doses are remaining, the color of the dose counter ring changes from green to red, indicating that only a few doses are remaining and you need to arrange for a new device. When the dose counter reads zero, it's time to discard the inhaler. To keep your inhaler clean, it's recommended to wipe the mouthpiece with a dry cloth or a tissue paper at least once a week. For more information on product, refer pack, insert or log on to breathefree.com or you can call on 9873333. 
Hi, we are going to learn how to use a zero stat VT spacer with pressurized meter dose inhaler in simple steps. The zero stat VT spacer has parts like inhalation chamber, a lock, a mouthpiece cap, a mouthpiece and a slot to put in the inhaler. Let's get started with the steps. First, assemble the spacer by joining the two halves of the spacer and rotate to lock them. Take your inhaler and open the mouthpiece cap and give the inhaler a good shake. Insert the inhaler into the slot provided in the Zerostat VT spacer. Press down the canister to release a dose into the spacer. You will see the medicine in the spacer. Exhale fully through your mouth. Then, open the cap of the Zerostat VT spacer and seal your lips around the mouthpiece without biting it. Inhale slowly and deeply. Remove the Zerostat VT spacer from your mouth and hold your breath for about 10 seconds or as long as you're comfortable. Then breathe out normally or alternatively. Keep your lips firmly closed around mouthpiece and continue to breathe normally 3 to 5 times. If you need another dose, wait for 1 minute and then repeat the earlier steps. After each dose, rinse your mouth with water and spit it out. That is very important. That's it. Now you have learned how to use Zerostat VT correctly. Important cleaning instructions. Clean the Zerostat VT spacer at least once a week. Separate the two parts of the spacer and rinse them with clean water. Shake them to remove excess water and let them air dry. Avoid using boiling or hot water for cleaning as it may harm the spacer. It's recommended to replace the Zerostat VT spacer with new one after 6 months of use. For more information on product, refer pack insert or log on to breathefree.com or you can call on 987-333-5577. Hi, today I will demonstrate how to use a half puff kit, a ready to use pre-assembled kit for children. The half puff kit consists of a baby mask, a zero stat VT spacer and a slot to insert a PMDI. It also comes in a robust storage case. So let's look at how to use half puff kit. First, open the mouthpiece cap of the inhaler then shake the inhaler well and insert it into the spacer. The device is now ready. Ensure your child is comfortably sitting. Hold the half puff kit firmly over your child's mouth and nose. Make sure that it fits snugly. Holding the inhaler, press the canister to release one dose into the half puff kit. You will see the dose released in the spacer. Hold the half puff kit in place for 30 seconds while the child is breathing normally. Thus, inhaling the medicine through the spacer. Remove the inhaler from the half puff kit and close the mouthpiece cap of the inhaler. If a second dose is prescribed, wait for about a minute before repeating the steps. That's it. Using a half puff kit is that simple. Some important instructions to keep in mind. Clean the half puff kit at least once a week. Separate the two halves of the spacer by rotating and gently pulling them apart. Rinse both halves in clean running water. Shake out excess water and air dry. Do not clean with boiling or hot water as this will damage your half puff kit. Replace the half puff kit with a new one after six months of use. For more information on the product, Refer the pack insert or log on to breathefree.com or you can call on 987-333-5577. Hi there, let's discuss good nebulization practices while using nebulizers. Care and maintenance of the nebulizer is very, very important part of the treatment. 
the process of nebulization is divided into three parts. Disinfecting the nebulizer before every use, using the nebulizer and lastly maintenance of the nebulizer. Please follow these steps while using nebulizers. Place the compressor on the sturdy surface so that the rubber pads are resting on it. Plug the power cord into the electric outlet. Connect one end of the nebulizer tubing to the compressor outlet. Open the cap of the medication chamber. There is a baffle inside the medication chamber. Add the medication into the chamber and then reattach the cap. There are three types of patient interfaces. Adult face mask, pediatric face mask and a mouthpiece. Attach face mask to the cap of the medication chamber and connect the tubing at the bottom of the medication chamber. Switch on the power and the compressor. Now let's understand how to hold the nebulizer. If you're using a mouthpiece, keep it between the teeth and place your lips around it. If you're using a face mask, then place the mask over the nose and mouth. Inhale slowly through the mouth and exhale slowly. Continue to breathe through the face mask or mouthpiece for the duration recommended. Please switch off the compressor when you hear the sputtering noise which indicates medication is about to run out. Let's understand things which are critical during the process of nebulization. Always wash your hands before using nebulizer. Sit upright and breathe normally with deep breaths in between. The level of solution in the nebulization chamber should not exceed 5 ml. Please do not talk during nebulization. During nebulization, do not let the mist enter the eyes. After nebulization, wash your face and gargle to clear your mouth. Let's see how to disinfect the nebulizer before every use. Use a clean container to soak all the accessories for 30 minutes in a commercially available medical disinfectant or a mild detergent or a vinegar solution. Please do not include tubing for this process. After 30 minutes with clean hands, rinse all accessories with warm water and air dry it. Maintenance of the nebulizer. Filter should be changed when it gets discolored. Wipe the outside of the compressor with the clean cloth regularly. After every use, please ensure you disconnect the tubing from the air outlet. Disassemble the mouthpiece, open the medication cap and remove the baffle. Wash as per instruction after every nebulization. Wipe the outlet surface of the tubing regularly. If you notice some liquid droplets in the tubing, connect it to the compressor air outlet. Switch on the compressor and blow air through the tubing for a few seconds. For more information on product, or log on to breathefree.com or you can call on 987 333 Thank you for the wonderful uh, video presentation to Team Sipla once again. And with that, Dr. Praveen, can I again request you to please demonstrate the Ellipta inhaler device? Yeah. So I'm going to uh, demonstrate Ellipta Trilogy. At, uh, as you can see in the screen, uh, as name suggests, it's uh, a triple combination, a multi-dose uh, DPI, drug, uh, dry powder inhalation technique. And you can see here, there is a cover which covers the mouthpiece and vent anteriorly and you can see the dosimeter here. So when you are ready to take uh, uh, inhaler, you will have to slide down this cover and you can hear click sound. Once you hear the click sound, uh, the, uh, the dose is loaded and you have to take initially a normal tidal breathing and once uh, you uh, uh, your breath out completely and then inhale and hold the mouthpiece in between your lips and uh, make sure the uh, lips are tightly uh, 
surrounding around the mouthpiece and inhales deep inhale deeply and steadily and then hold your breath so i'll just show you how to take once the drug is loaded so you are hearing the click so and after this uh, uh, you can do uh, rinse your mouth and gargles thank you thank you so much um, i think it's very sweet of you to demonstrate that for us thank you again dr praveen and uh, it's an amazing response that we are getting to this topic um, which is uh, like i'll again reiterate that dr krishna sir is brain child and uh, we have around 1331 logins at this point which is an excellent number and uh, to add to our excitement we are actually already getting questions from the audience so i think let's begin from uh, questions with the audience today for the change uh, from tamil nadu we've got a question what is the efficacy and drawbacks of spacer inhaler dr dipti would you want like to answer that please yes thank you for the question ma'am uh so the efficacy of the spacer is of course i have already mentioned in the talk uh, it is a uh, uh, add on to the uh, mdi so if the patient is not having a good uh, hand to mouth uh, coordination then uh, that is the reason we use a spacer so uh, any patient even uh, from a child to an elderly or to a incapacitated patient uh this option is available uh, if they don't have a nebulizer so even in acute conditions um, in emergency situations where a nebulizer is not available a spacer can be uh, taken up and uh, used as a, a multiple uh, single dose actuations uh, to uh, replace a nebulizer but the drawbacks are always there so uh, if it's not cleaned well then it itself becomes a source for the uh, infection and uh, if the uh, correct uh, inhalation delay happens if there is a delay in the inhalation then lot of the drug is deposited in the spacer itself and uh, very less uh, lung deposition happens so uh, there is also a, a chance that uh, multiple actuations happen in the same spacer so the patient doesn't know is not happy with the amount of drug reaching his mouth so they uh, take up multiple uh, drugs uh, actuations uh, so a lot of drug is uh, wasted there so th there are uh, drawbacks to a spacer but again if they are uh, willing and they are ready to uh, learn and uh, you know with such uh, patient education videos i think these uh, issues can always be solved uh, uh, easily very well said dr deepthi and definitely i think uh... uh she covered all the points there's another question from dr ahmed uh dr ahmed i would request you to kindly elaborate your question your question is particle size and deposition in larynx but with which device i am unable to understand so if you could please uh you know enlighten us with that there's a, a question from dr ajay athavle from maharashtra do respuls need dilution for nebulization and if yes which diluent So since Dr. Praveen, you were talking about nebulizer, I'll uh, pose this question to you, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, uh, when you are using salbutamol uh, uh, respules, uh, you you can dilute with uh, a normal uh, saline, a sterile normal saline, and most of the respules are provided with the dedicated uh, a sterile normal saline. So you can uh, dilute with that. and nowadays most of the uh, whatever uh, respules are available those uh, don't need uh, dilution at all at uh, nowadays so whatever you used to use ipratropium before uh, a single uh, uh, respule or that uh, we used to get bottle and uh, salbutamol you need uh, dilution right so currently available respule don't really need a dilution so uh, there is basically no need however if needed like uh, um, dr praveen said that you can use normal saline uh, there's another question from my home state dr dinesh from bilwara is asking while using mdi with space so whether the inhaler is pressed in closed face with the cap on or after putting the mouthpiece in the mouth of the patient uh, 
so dr bhaskar would you want to uh, take this question please sorry can you repeat the question please while using mdi with spacer whether the inhaler right. press in closed spacer with the cap on or after putting the mouthpiece in the mouth of the patient i am not getting the question while using mdi with the spacer so whether you use the inhaler uh, while you are using the inhaler with the uh, spacer so whether you press the mdi first after connecting to the spacer or you press it after you have put it in the patient's mouth okay the okay sorry sorry the i was not getting the question this has already been demonstrated in the video also it's uh, generally we have to put in the mouth and we have to close the lips tightly and then we have to actuate the inhaler and uh, after getting uh, after 30 second we can again actuate the second dose right so perfectly said and uh, while we get some more audience questions i would really like to thank the ones who have asked and dr ahmed we are waiting for your question uh, however you know we are talking about inhalation we've talked about a lot of devices but i would uh, start again with a very basic question at what are the uh, different ways of drug deposition especially in the airways dr bhaskar could you please answer that again yeah that's fantastic question and uh, if we talk about drug deposition generally there are three ways of drug deposition the inertial impaction the sedimentation and diffusion talking about the inertial impaction generally when the drug uh, comes from the uh, or it's actuated from the inhaler then because of the velocity because of the speed of the drug generally the larger particles they get deposited into the larger uh, into the oropharynx or the larger airways so this we can say the inertial impaction method and the particle size from 0.5 to around 5 microns they remain suspended in the lower airways and if they get time they sediment there so this is the second process by which the drug gets deposited that is sedimentation and uh, talking about the third process it's the diffusion and particle size less than 0.5 microns they, they generally diffuse across the alveolus into the uh, into the blood stream so generally there are three main processes that the momentum caused by the impaction and the sedimentation and the diffusion finally these are the ways by which the drug gets deposited into the airways right perfectly said and a complex interplay of all three totally decides how much drug is actually del delivered and deposited into the airways and at till what level so perfectly said dr bhaskar thank you uh, dr praveen my next question would again be to you that uh, you know we are talking about inhalation therapy so what are the different uh, carrier carriers that you know are used to uh, deliver the drug to uh, uh, you know the carriers that we use in different devices whether it is a mdi or it is a dpi yeah so uh, 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 most commonly used carriers are like uh, lactose monohydrate so mostly used in dpis and uh, there are some uh, carriers that has been used in different studies like uh, dimanitol glucose manitol sucrose at some time and the, why these carriers are important like when when uh, the main problem with the dpi is the agglomeration and the cohesion of a uh, uh, micro sized size uh, drug particles and to avoid this problem we have to uh, 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 the mix that uh, uh, whatever drug particle with a carrier to improve the flowability of the uh, drug particle and to avoid the agglomeration and produce accurate dosing so these are some carriers and most commonly used is lactose monohydrate that's why when you use uh, a dpis you get uh, sometime a sweeter effect a sweeter uh, test that is because of lactose monohydrate so there are uh, some uh, new uh, uh, carriers as well so uh, like uh, hydro hydroxy appetite carriers and uh, uh, in studies in some studies that has given like more and higher uh, drug uh, deposition and uh, it gives a more uh, respirable uh, uh, drug particles when you use in uh, dpis and mdis right 
uh, as you correctly said i think also there are many other um, carriers which are uh, under study which are of course liposomes then there are palmospheres and then there are also i think biodegradable polymers that yes of the both of course they are also under way uh, and also i'll again go back to the audience uh, dr subramanyam from tamil nadu compliments everybody for the nice uh, topic this is being discussed there is um, another question from tamil nadu which is uh, millimeter of rescue solution to be used in children based on weight so uh, dr dipti would you want to answer this about how much rescue solution to be used in children based on weight thank you for the question ma'am so usually in children we uh, opt for 2 ml so 2 ml of the uh, respi uh, respuel and a 2 ml of dilutant which is usually added uh, directly the respuel is not given to a child uh, for nebulizer so uh, usually the dilutant as uh, dr pravin has already mentioned is uh, a normal saline or uh, distilled water but uh, this uh, uh, dilution is what is important rather than the ml used because the child is not going to be sitting there for 20 minutes taking the entire dose so whatever uh, goes into uh, the uh, child has to be diluted prior to uh, uh, usage that is uh, what is more important so usually the dosage is 2 ml of the respuel uh, diluted with 2 ml of the diluted right uh, so dr subramanyam we hope that that has answered your question dr jayaraman again somebody uh, who's quite a leader he uh, is always attending and very actively participating in the cci webinars is asking if there is any disease specific drug delivery like ultra fine particle use in small airway disease asthma and copd dr bhaskar would you want to answer this please thank you for the question and what i think uh, till now there's only if we talk about disease specific then uh, only in recent days this concept of uh, small airway disease and uh, ultra fine particles for treating the small airway disease has came and what i think uh, before that we never we don't go for any disease specific for uh, formulation it's up to the it's according to the patient ki what is the age of patient what is the means if patient has any comorbidities or not means hand mouth coordination problems or not otherwise uh, i don't think there uh, there is any specific disease related ki we can give this type of formulation in this disease only anybody wants to add anything else to that dr pravin dr yeah i think yeah so only uh, at present only uh, a fine particle uh, uh, dpis are available for a smaller airways uh, and mainly used for copd and asthma so i think beclomethazone is one drug which yes. is a fine particle and specifically used for small airway uh, diseases uh, so uh, dr jairaman sir i hope uh, that is what you were wanting to ask and we've answered your question uh so with that again um, there is another question from telangana dr sakshi batra wants to ask of course she's complimenting us again for wonderful webinar and how it's going can she wants to know if we can highlight on deposition rate of various devices and which one offers greater deposition dr deepthi so this was already mentioned in the talk ma'am uh, uh, it the best the lung deposition was seen with a breath actuated inhaler so it was almost 20% more than the other uh, inhalers but apart from that if we really uh, see a good uh, technique with an mdi and a spacer will also be equally as good as a breath actuated inhaler but when you really compare just the devices it is breath actuated inhaler which gives the best deposition yes absolutely i i think i agree i hope uh, my other panelists agree as well doctor uh, uh, doctor ravi i'll come back to you so what are the other factors we've discussed of course the different methods of drug deposition but apart from that what are the other factors which play a role which contribute in the deposition of drug in the lungs since we've, we've already discussed particle size do you think there's anything else yes there are many factors we can uh, classify it as patient related factors the device related factors and the formulation related factors 
which play a part in uh, drug deposition. If talking about uh, the formulation related, then there are different devices, whether it's MDI, whether it's DPI, there is some, like in Symbicord, there is a different uh, particle. It is means there is a, the particles from spherocytes, spheroid, spheroidal particles. So what is the size of particles? If the size of the particle is the optimum size of particle to get deposited is 2 to 5 micrometer. If the particle size is larger, then definitely it will not get deposited into the smaller airway and it will uh, go into the oropharynx. And if the particle size is very small, say it's less than 0. 0.5, then it will cross the barrier, this alveolus surface and go into the bloodstream. Then talking about the uh, this was uh, related to the formulation. If we talk about patient related factors, then as discussed, and we all know the biggest and the biggest thing is the technique of inhaler. If uh, in patient related factor, the first and most common thing is if patient is using a good technique, then deposition is uh, around double if uh, they are taken with a poor technique. And then uh, considering patient and factor, there is what is that kind of disease? Kind of disease means if there is so much bronchoconstriction, then the delivery to the small airways is limited. Or if there is excess mucus production, so what kind of uh, we are giving inhalational device for which kind of patient if they are narrow airways if there is a lot of mucus plugging if there is severe disease then of course it will decrease the drug delivery and then of course what is the type of device we are using it's nebulizer it's uh, as ma'am mentioned dipti ma'am ki with pressurized beta dose inhaler and breath actuated inhaler the device the drug delivery is very much more as compared to dpi which have only 20 percent drug delivery so these are the various factors which have to be looked when we think of the drug delivery in the airways. Right. I think you've summed it up perfectly well that uh, what matters is basically the physics of the particle size, the patient's uh, you know anatomy of the respiratory tract, depending also on what is the uh, actual disease uh, or the other comorbid respiratory conditions that the patient has, and also the airflow patterns that are uh, present in that particular patient. So I think you covered it all very wonderfully and in great detail. And with that, Dr. DP, I'll come back to you. So uh, you, you've talked extensively about uh, inhalational devices. We've discussed the techniques. But you know, when a patient is sitting across you in the OPD, what are the factors which depend on, uh, you know, when you are deciding what is this, the ideal device for this particular patient? So what are those things that help you make that uh, crucial, critical decision? So yes, ma'am, the criteria uh, uh, when you select an uh, uh, inhaler is number one, is the patient a conscious patient? So does the is a patient able to understand uh, the technique? Will will they be able to uh, uh, you know really uh, take in the points and uh, follow the instructions well? So if it is a patient who is able to do that, then our choice is more. Whereas if that is not there, if it's an unconscious patient or a partially conscious patient, then we have only nebulizer uh, as our option. So when it comes to a conscious patient, then again, the next point to consider is whether uh, they are having a good hand to mouth co coordination. So if that is uh, there, then again, the options are more. We have the option of giving an MDI. We have the option of giving a DPI, a breath actuated. Everything is there. But if that is not there, then we have to think of spacer uh, and add-on uh, devices. Apart from this, the most important thing is the inspiratory flow. So if the patient is having a good inspiratory flow, then uh, we have to uh, preferably give a DPI. Because that is uh, uh, ensuring a better uh, learning opportunity for them. It is easier for them to do. It is uh, cheaper on the pocket. And it is also something where multiple uh, drugs can be given from the same device. Whereas when it comes to an MDI, there is only an option of uh, whatever fixed uh, drug is there in the device. Whereas when you're giving a DPI, you can give multiple uh, capsules, multiple options. So if the patient is having a good inspiratory flow, definitely a DPI is preferred. But if that uh, patient is having a very severe COPD or asthma, then of course we have to opt for an MDI and preferably with a spacer. 
and apart from that now the option of breath actuated has come where this coordination is less required so if uh, the patient is affordable and if they are ready to take on uh, an a breath actuated then the uh, breath actuated will jump over an mdi uh, when you are selecting the device yeah sure so and uh, i would just like to add that a breath actuated uh, inhaler actually is today even cheaper than a mdi with spacer so i think cost also it is actually quite cost effective and since you're talking about uh, dpis as well uh, i would also like to add here that now there is also a device available in the market uh, and i'm stating this to cover all points that there is a device available in the market wherein you can deliver two dpi drugs at the same time with the same inhaler so um, only to cover all bases i think uh, this is what uh, uh, my anybody else wants to add anything dr praveen it seems you want to add something yeah i i echo all the points what uh, dr dipti madam has said and you had said yeah okay. so i'll come to you dr praveen now so uh, you know we are talking about uh, drugs which can actually be given uh, through the uh, inhaled route and it will be incomplete if we do not talk about the antibiotics that one can you know use through the inhaled route uh, would you please like to enlighten us through that yeah uh, uh, as we see uh, in uh, in our daily icu uh, uh, rounds we see a lot of uh, non cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis patients on ventilator ventilated associated pneumonia and uh, uh, at times we we have to give uh, nebulized antibiotics and currently only two antibiotics are us fda approved which is gentamicin and colistin so most commonly we use these two when you uh, uh, talk about col uh, colistin we we have uh, in india we have uh, uh, two uh, uh, doses is available now 1 million uh, international units and 2 million international units and we give uh, 1 million mostly in my practice we uh, i use 1 million international unit uh, bd doses and uh, you can go up to actually a, a 9 million unit sometimes if required and uh, the other uh, most commonly used is tobramycin in uh, mostly in cystic fibrosis patient but there are there are studies in non cystic uh, 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 um, uh, bronchiectasis as, as well non cystic uh, fibrosis so uh, in those patients uh, uh, in patients with the pseudomonal uh, colonization when you have uh, uh, chronic copd patient uh, with uh, uh, pseudomonas or klebsiella uh, colonization there you can use a different uh, uh, nebulized antibiotics like you can try a nebulized uh, tobramycin or colistin nebulized polymyxin uh, uh, sometimes uh, amikacin as well so we have used a nebulized amikacin in ntm patient and uh, uh there are studies uh, where they have uh, used uh, uh, even uh, mdi containing uh, leofloxacin and ciprofloxacin and other one one more antibiotic which is now we have been uh, we have uh, we are using is astrionam although it is not us us uh, uh, approved but still we are using it so uh, very rarely we use uh, nebulized antibiotics when you need and when you are using nebulized antibiotic you will have to give systemic antibiotic as well so uh, these are the points when we uh, consider microbiota or uh, uh, colonization or we have to uh, eradicate uh, 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 a chronic colonization of pseudomonas or klebsiella in the airway in uh, copd or uh, community uh, sorry ventilator associated uh, pneumonias right so correctly said i think you covered all the points of all the antibiotics that have been used or can be used so uh, with that my very dear friend dr vijay kumar chennam chetty from hyderabad who needs no introduction is um, asking a great question he wants to know if we can talk about lung microbiota and if there is any futuristic way to optimize the lung microbiota with nebulized antibiotic uh, dr bhaskar would you want to take that question please the lung uh, abhi still what i think is still studies are going for all these antibiotics to prove and to develop a key which antibiotics are useful and which are uh, useful for which infection this is under investigation and trials are going on and we need uh, some randomized controlled trials and large studies 
to see it. but this question is very important and we have to i think we have to go for this topic for this research um anybody wants to add anything so i just like to add that uh, uh, definitely i think lung microbiota is something that there is a lot of research going on uh, okay he wants to know if it's bacterial nebulization not not antibiotics but with nebulized bacteria about microbiota so it's under it's a uh, study which is under uh, going on where they are trying to uh, put nanoparticles with bacteria into the lung to improve the microbiome of the lung so i don't think it's really come into practice yet but uh, if anybody is aware of it happening anywhere then i think i would be delighted to know so uh, yeah i think it is still under study and even in terms of microbiota i don't think uh, there's a lot happening in india at least as far as i know and please enlighten us if anybody thinks there is but yes overseas there are like a lot of research and a lot of papers being published and it is quite an advanced thing that uh, they actually assess the microbiota of patients who are more prone to recurrent infective exacerbations whether they are copds or bronchitis or cystic fibrosis and once a patient gets admitted with an exacerbation they actually predict with the microbiota that might what possibly is the organism responsible and then start empirical uh, antibiotics based on that data which is of course extremely helpful when we are having to give empirical antibiotics and also proves to be extremely uh, useful in terms of saving the patient's crucial time when they la land up uh, with a secondary infection or sepsis so and uh, in terms of uh, uh, bacterial nebulization like dr deepthi said i think it's still under study at least from what all of us know and dr vijay will be happy to know if you can add to our knowledge please something like the probiotic prebiotic of the gut so they are yeah. trying to renew the maintain absolutely uh so uh, while we we've talked about particle size we've talked about the inhaled antibiotics we we are talking about inhaled therapy in general so it would be incomplete if we do not actually discuss the uh, side effects that are possible so uh, dr bhaskar would you want to enlighten us about the local side effects that are possible with the inhaled therapies that we use yeah yeah the c the common local side effect if we talk uh, they are mostly attributed to inhaled corticosteroids and the most common side effects we all know it's dysphonia oropharyngeal candidiasis and all these things if we talk about dysphonia the postulated mechanism is like dysphonia is probably because of bilateral adductor myopathy or inflammatory infiltrates in the mucosa and if we talk about oropharyngeal candidiasis we all know steroid is a very strong uh, immunosuppressant drug and because of its immunosuppressant effect some uh, around 3% patients uh, who are on inhalational therapy they develop oropharyngeal candidiasis and the chances are more if uh, patient is immunocompromised due to some reason and then as deepthi madam uh, told in her is is like there is cold free on effect because of cold free on effect patient when the drug is released from the nozzle with the uh, when it is released it's around minus 30 degree and when it hits our throat uh, it's around 0 degree and with such a force of 110 to 140 km per hour with 0 degree uh, temperature when it hits our throat the muscle gets spasm and patient starts coughing so a lot of time we'll say patient complains ki when he takes mdi or inhaler he starts coughing because of that so these are some local side effects which we generally get dysphonia and uh, oropharyngeal candidiasis the most common one absolutely correctly said and i think that is the one major reason that we ask all our patients to gargle like we gargle rinse and gargle no oh. so i think uh, that reduces the chances of developing oropharyngeal candidiasis even further so that's uh, uh, with that this is about the local uh, side effects dr deepthi would you want to tell us about any other issues that you particularly face uh, you know with your patients coming back to you when they are advised uh, inhalational devices or inhalational therapy in any form 
Uh, yes, uh, ma'am, uh, I think the majority of it has been covered by Dr. Ravi, sir. <clears throat> but apart from that, uh, I have noticed most of my patients don't know how to maintain their uh, uh, DPI capsules well. So there is a, a growing uh, thing that they, they cover it with some paper, you know, two capsules in a paper and they keep it in their pocket. And uh, uh, there are a few who uh, just wrap it around a cloth so all that moisture uh, causes clumping and uh, there is a loss of uh, the potential uh, potent drug so uh, this issue comes up when they start uh, when they need it in an emergency and they come and say no ma'am the capsule is not working uh, it is it, the, there is no powder coming out so the it is so important for them to uh, for us to uh, teach them that the capsule should not leave the box and it has to stay in that uh, box which has been provided and how to to keep it in the cover so that uh, the moisture content is to the minimum so uh, this is the major issue i have faced uh, when uh, patients have come back uh, with their uh, dpi inhalers right i think i completely agree with that that uh, very often and very often they would you know just keep one capsule within their inhaler to be used in an emergency. So I think even that is a very common practice that at least I see my patient going. So uh, with that, I'll act now, um, move to Dr. Praveen. Dr. Praveen, uh, these are the various issues that you know we face. But do you, uh, because you know most of these patients actually have a lot of comorbidities. So do you think there are any specific drugs that would affect the drug deposition so any systemic drugs which the patient is taking already maybe for any other disease which which might actually affect the drug deposition that we should always keep in mind when we are prescribing this therapy yeah so uh, 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 especially when patients are uh, having uh, glaucoma and when you are using anticholinergics uh, and when you are especially using nebulization they can cause a deposition of uh, uh, anticholinergic agent into the eyes and that can exacerbate glaucoma uh, especially i don't know the any like any systemic drug that can uh, cause a decline or decrease in drug deposition as uh, like other pan panelists uh, can add to this anybody wants to add anything i think the only uh, thing that can really reduce drug deposition is smoking so if the patient is smoking and using an inhaler, then definitely the drug deposition is going to come down because uh, smoke as such itself interacts with the uh, drug uh, aerosol and uh, reduces its uh, absorption. So uh, if they are do smoking and using an inhaler, then might as well not use it at all. I think um, uh, sometimes these patients are also on beta blockers for their cardiac diseases. So I think that's one disease, uh, one uh, class of drug that we have to be very, very of, very uh, vigilant about telling our cardiologists that this patient might have to, you know, stop beta blockers if possible, or at least switch. But most times, actually, even the cardio selective ones are known to cause some degree of bronchoconstriction. So that's something that might actually affect the drug deposition. Um, uh, so I think that's one thing that we have to be vigilant about and since dr dp you were talking about smoking so of course smoking we uh, now know that is something that you know does cause uh, issues with uh, drug deposition and like you very correctly said that the patient might actually not just take an inhaler at all if they continue to smoke uh, and especially copd i would feel at that so do you think also there's any relation of pollution or uh, biomass fuel exposure that we actually have a lot in India. Uh, does that also play a role like that? Yes, ma'am. It's the same uh, effect. That is ultimately these environmental pollutants, the, the sm environmental uh, smoke or whatever, which has really interact with uh, the, these, uh, uh, the drug and it will uh, reduce the uh, absorption of the drug. Apart from that, even generally, it is seen that in smokers, the cytochrome uh, P450, the enzymes, even they are more active and uh, they also metabolize the drug faster. 
so uh, there is a lot of drug lost uh, if the patient is smoking so uh, really it is not recommended uh, along uh, with uh, inhalers absolutely absolutely and, and more than that i think another thing i wanted to uh, stress is when the efficacy is coming down the chance of uh, steroid resistance goes up so uh, the patient is going to use more and more uh, you know actuations and more steroids more uh, inhaled steroids are going to be used and they're going to end up with steroid resistance uh, in the future especially asthma patients very beautifully highlighted thank you doc dr deepi i think you beautifully and extensively covered all the possible points uh, with doc with that dr bhaskar i'll come back to you so i am sure that you know we all in our practice i don't think in india there's any practitioner who does not encounter myths related to uh, you know inhalational therapy because most times people don't want to take at least to begin with the first time that you tell them that you know we want to put you on an inhaler the first reaction is or no attached to some myth or the other so what are these myths that you encounter and how do you actually uh, try and convince your patient about taking the inhaler thank you ma'am for this question this is my favorite question and as you said ki all the practitioners and everyone <laughs> here in this uh, webcast everyone has at some time of time felt the resistance for the ki patient ki yeah, i no i will not take inhaler and you know what is the paradox ki if we search literature then the in the inhalational therapy we talk about inhalational therapy it has its roots from india only from 2000 bc earlier the uh, people in india they used to smoke the dried leaves of dhatura and they get relief from the cough and uh, breathlessness and now what is the situation people are uh, the patients are avoiding to take inhalational therapy and yes definitely there are certain myths there are because of their own imagination and the their the ignorance these all things leads to certain myth and uh, if we talk about fact then definitely there is some we have evidence we have some science behind that so coming on to the common myths which i think sabse pehle to doc sab iski aadat lag jayegi ki inhalers are addictive if we prescribe inhaler to any means uh, children or young age group patient to first of all they say ki no doctor please don't give the inhaler otherwise it will become uh, addictive and if we the and if we talking about fact we all know that inhalers are not addictive as they are not going to the brain anything which is going to the brain say what we uh, what i tell used to my uh, i used to tell my patient the same thing ki दवाई अगर दिमाग में जाएगी इफ इट विल गो इन टू द ब्रेन एंड देन दे कॉज सम सॉर्ट ऑफ एडिक्शन लाइक द टोबैको लाइक एल्कोहल एंड दो काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स एंड दिस मेडिसिन इज गोइंग डायरेक्टली टू द लंग्स एंड देन इट्स ओवर इट्स नॉट गोइंग इन टू द ब्रेन इट्स नॉट गोइंग टू द ब्रेन देन हाउ कैन इट कॉज एडिक्शन द अदर कॉमन मिथ्स आर कि दीज इनहेलर्स हैव लॉट्स ऑफ साइड इफेक्ट्स we all know that inhalers are the most uh, safe means uh, safest medicine as far as uh, allopathic medicine is concerned we can give inhaler to very old even 80 to 90 year old patient we can give inhalation to 7 to 8 months baby we can give inhalational therapy to pregnant ladies so uh, we can think ki how much safe these uh, inhalers are then lot of patients say ki sir why to give inhaler give me tablet or syrup they it is better why no why to go for inhaler or lot of patients say ki are sab ye doc sab ye to last option hai ki why you are giving first inhaler we all know that inhalers are the first treatment and not the last uh, we have to start with inhaler because uh, as it is already told in the Uh, presentation also they are very safe we have to give very less doses of medicine and uh, the targeted drug delivery the drug goes directly to the uh, part where it is needed the fast duration of action so obviously the inhaler should be the first choice and not the last and the uh, it's the movie effect that the patient sees and say oh inhaler are to be used when there is no other option so this is a myth 
in fact as we all know that they have to be the first then there is certain method inhaler these must be so costly as uh, talked already inhalational therapy is not now so and uh, if we talk about inhalational therapy i think it's the most economic in india otherwise if we uh, we get uh, generally we all get patient from abroad and they means uh, once a patient from uh, uk came to me and uh, she started telling me ki tiotropium there in uk if we talk in indian currency it's costing around 3500 rupees Three, uh, one single uh, that uh, add, uh, that pack of dpi so it's so much different so uh the this is a myth ki inhalers are so costly they are addictive they should not be given to child they should be last treatment option so we generally see lots of myths while talking about inhalational therapy yeah i i totally agree i think also one myth that we very commonly see is that uh they feel that you know they should stop inhalers as soon as they are better ha ah, yes i think that's also a very common thing at least like how i like to counsel my patients i also tell them this is like using spectacles because you know spectacles is something so common that people use it and i tell them you know even if you can see properly with these spectacles it's not that you will get rid of them you will still continue to use it because that is what is making you see properly so that's a very layman uh, example that i often give um i'll take few more questions from the audience uh dr vijay is again asking so he wants to know okay, sorry i am sorry one second i am not able to open his question he has a very interesting question actually i read it that unlike the gut microbiome in which probiotics can obviously be used to restore normal gi flora and no such respiratory probiotic currently exists however in a preclinical model episodic installation of oral commensals into the lower respiratory tract modified host susceptibility to respiratory pathogen these types of investigations may provide the biological plausibility that microbiome modification in the lung could provide health benefits by preventing recurrent exacerbations so anybody wants to comment on this dr praveen dr bhaskar yeah so uh, like completely this topic is new for us so it's yeah it's still uh, uh, it should be uh, studied and uh, we should actually use like gastrointestinal uh, uh, patients we need to study microbiota and uh, use of uh, uh, different microbiomes in uh, uh, chronic pulmonary infections and diseases right next is a comment from dr ajay uh, lanjewar from maharashtra sir is saying that breath attenuated device is costly than md and spacer as spacer is a one time purchase for one year yes i think with that logic definitely so it is but uh, i think i myself actually buy and use the product for the um, synpro breath and it costs somewhere around 500 something for an entire month so i think that's something which is totally acceptable and most people can actually afford it uh there's uh, another extremely interesting question from uh, Ajayson, which is that there were nebulized anti-TB uh, drugs which were under research a decade back, and also with that, I like to add about the uh, anti-non-tubercle mycobacterial drugs as well. And Dr. Praveen, uh, I think all my questions for nebulized therapy are yeah. somehow. Yeah. So, so there are. Yeah. Thank. Thank you for this question. So there are. Uh, there were some studies going on uh, uh, a long back. Uh, they have used nebulized. Uh, Uh, uh even isoniazid nebulized pyrazinamide and rifampicin and uh, most commonly they have used nebulized amikacin when when you cannot give uh, uh, like uh, systemic amikacin is contraindicated or uh, some systemic administration is impractical and where long term uh, uh, treatment is required then you can consider uh, inhaled or nebulized uh, amikacin and uh, there are few studies uh, uh where they have used nebulized amikacin in uh, cystic fibrosis patients who are having ntm infection ntm uh, infection and wh whom uh, uh, the amikacin uh, treatment is uh, required for longer uh, number of months uh, 
and so uh, there, there's no not enough work on this uh, inhaled anti tb drugs against uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis in spite of it has a great potential and uh, yeah we should again i think study that but uh, 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 but definitely uh, inhaled or nebulized amikacin has a, has a role in ntm at least and we'll have to study in uh, 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 in tb as well yeah, right um, recently amikacin is also the, it is uh, recommended by it is uh, approved from us fda for use in no ntm infections it got approval from us fda also okay right uh, just that i think they see much less of ntm and tb and uh, i mean if it comes from uh, the uh, southeast asian subcontinent or africa i think it's just that the numbers are maybe going to be uh, much bigger there than than really in the us that's and, and that's completely my own opinion uh, uh, ajay sir is again asking another question what doses and after how many years this monia and oropharyngeal candidiasis uh, i think sir is wanting to ask uh, after how, what doses and after how many years do dysphonia and oropharyngeal candidiasis occur when we are talking about inhaled corticosteroids dr deepthi would you want to answer this question please i think we don't have to wait for years uh, sir it it is a, a very common uh, side effect if they are not gargling if the patient is not gargling after uh, using the inhaled uh, steroid then uh, we can expect it within a month also so uh, it is not uh, like uh, it is it's going to take years for that to happen it is not that the patient has to be immunocompromised or on any kind of immunocompromised drugs even a normal asthmatic patient uh, if they are not gargling we can expect an oropharyngeal candidiasis to happen within a month so sure. or maybe even sooner actually i just recently got a patient practically within a week 10 days she got such massive of course she she is a known diabetic so she got such massive uh, oropharyngeal candidiasis because we had asked her to gargle we had asked her son to gargle but then she forgot about it and the son went back to his job and forgot to check about it. so i think that's something that the that, importance of follow up uh, ma'am so the technique is something that we may need to check uh, very frequently also reinstate every time that they have to gargle check how many times they are taking it so i think those are things that we can actually never just do enough for any of our patients that is something that we just need to go on and on with and for every patient and with that i like to share krishna sir's comment so sir says that the highly aged geriatric especially those who are a dentures should be considered as pediatric and half puff kit works wonderfully in them geriatric and pediatrics are same in many ways and i cannot agree more sir i think in practice we all do that but when we are talking and especially in such an important topic that's something that we must really remember and mention so thank you for pointing that out sir has also put in a few more uh, comments uh, ma'am uh, it's there in the whatsapp uh. okay i haven't really seen that yes. is another question from uh, dr ajay uh what is the precautions while giving nebulizer in elderly with known and unknown glaucoma if nebulizer has to be given i think dr uh, uh, praveen has talked about it and uh, with that i like to take sir's comments from the whatsapp group if at all i would be permitted uh i think we are going very well uh Dr. Deepthi, can you actually read them? Because I'm sorry, I cannot. I think in so many messages now, I'm unable to locate Sir's messages. Can you please do that for me? Yes, yes, ma'am. So he has uh, uh, very uh, aptly uh, commented that uh, he has never prescribed an MDI without a spacer in his last 24 years of practice, except when he has given a breath actuated device. So this uh, is particularly to avoid the cold freon effect. I totally agree, sir. and uh, another point is uh, although it is not clinically proven adrenaline nebulization is vastly used in bronchiolitis especially in pediatric population um uh, using inhalers is not a habit but a requirement and uh, very uh, cutely he has mentioned uh, eating pani puri is the habit eating food is a requirement i think i totally agree sir uh, so we do so many non essential things to live a healthy life Uh, like uh, bathing brushing wearing clothes which animals don't 
so then how can using inhalation therapy for a healthy life uh, you know not be cultivated as a habit so i think yes these are his uh, points uh, and uh, very very important ones very very aptly said sir and about adrenaline i would also like to add that i i think um, at least i have used adrenaline in severe bronchitis patients so we dilute it and uh, use it so that's another drug that we use uh, dilute it and sometimes it works wonderfully well very offbeat i mean i don't think another drug that we have used which i am not sure if it's you know written anywhere indicated or at least it's not in the guidelines is the uh, fusamide lasix is something that again we used or inhaled bronchitis spasm very uh, i won't say often but very rarely in severe bronchitis spasm not responding to anything else we have often given it a try very rarely given it a try uh, honestly so i think those are also a little offbeat indications i'm not sure i mean are when nebulized as a um, uh, as in this uh, acetyl cysteine is also uh, to be mentioned i think so i was actually going to talk about that uh, nebulized mucolytics is something that we haven't really talked about and that was something that i was uh, you know going to to come to and uh, uh, dr dipti since you're talking about it would you want to add to it yes ma i think it's a, a brilliant uh, uh, thing that came up uh, uh, years ago when uh, we started giving um, uh, nnstyle cysteine as nebulizers because uh, all the uh, ventilated patients and all the patients who were on niv i mean they were not uh, able to uh, produce uh, sputum they were not able to expectorate and this was a brilliant method where uh, nebulized uh, nnstyle cysteine was working wonders and it was really doing its uh, mucolytic uh, uh, job and uh, they were able to bring out at least uh, through tracheal uh, suctioning it we could uh, you know take it out uh, from the uh, lung so uh, nebulized uh, nnstyle cysteine was a wonder drug i think the other drug that we were using uh, from historical times at least from as long as i can remember is 3% uh, saline which is hypotonic saline that i think has been a blanket use of uh, mucolytic and uh, uh, one more drug that comes to my mind and is also again an excellent mucolytic when used uh, as an embolization is mesna and yes. uh, i think we get excellent results with mesna as well in fact sometimes uh, a very obvious indication that during even bronchoscopies we have proper thick mucus plugs we have actually instilled mesna in a diluted form within the bronchi through the bronchoscope so even uh, sometimes that actually does wonders and uh, uh, dr praveen this is required uh, special mentions <laughs> this is one nebulization question that i did not intentionally give to you because otherwise it would have seemed like all uh, nebulizer related questions are going to you with that i'll take another question from my dear friend uh, dr vijay again so nebulized cocktail with adrenaline steroid and salbutamol works wonders in post extubation strider to decrease cord edema so that's a comment sorry not a question and uh, absolutely i think uh, yes we all use nebulized steroid with adrenaline i think for post extubation strider as well and for resistant cough lignocaine nebulization works good yes i think that's again an extremely valid point for uh, intractable continuous non uh, the only thing i think i practice is when i give them a lignocaine nebulization i tell them not to eat or drink for some time afterwards so i think that's one precaution that i do take and while we are talking about we've talked a lot about nebulization we talked about mucolytics i'd like to go back to the inhalation therapy you know so uh, we 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 talked about elderly we talked about uh, uh, the normal uh, population but uh, i think we need a special mention about kids we've talked about nebulization in kids and like sir mentioned that the half puff kit is something that we can use in kids uh, so i think uh, that's maybe in very young kids but i think in slightly elder kids we go to inhalational devices per se so what are these different devices that we actually use for kids and uh, how do you decide that dr bhaskar would you want to answer that please yes actually there uh, we are, we all have faced challenges when administering ad- uh, inhalational therapy in kids because this is because of the, the anatomy and physiology is different in kids the while using 
of course if we say by years then uh, generally if we uh, kid is more, more than four or less than four if patient is, if the kid is less than four then it's uh, better to give mdi with the space with a face mask in more than four years we can give mdi with the spacer because the children they cannot perform controlled breathing maneuvers the proper maneuver which we tell ki first of all exhale then inhale then hold the breath and all these maneuvers so it's difficult there are certain things which we can do like uh, the, because kids cannot generate so much inspiratory flow generally to so as to open the valve of a spacer so like zero strat vt spacer we can tilt upward slightly so that its valve get opened when we are giving inhaler to kids this is a maneuver which we can do or uh, it's a uh, there is a myth ki if uh, the uh, sometimes we have seen ki is it good to give inhaler inhalational therapy if the child is crying but what happens is during crying ki kid generally exhales more and take very shallow breathing so if we are giving uh, any of the inhalational uh, thing while the patient is crying of course if it's not an emergency if it's an emergency then we have to give uh, we should give whether it's a deep, uh, mdi with this spacer or nebulizer or whatever but generally we should avoid when the patient is crying because it decreases the uh dose of the drug so these are the few things which we can consider in kids uh, the best thing is if child is less than 4 we have uh, we can go for with the space up with face mask and if the child is more than 4 and he can uh, obey the orders he can understand the things then we can give him directly mdi with this space up i think very practical tips dr ravi you shared that of course you know uh, the spacer can be treated up to open the wall not to give that when child is crying because the breathing is going to be shallow the drug delivery is going to be compromised and i think also uh, if the child is hyperventilating or tachypneic that is also uh, one uh, point where we have to remember not to uh, because that the drug delivery is going to be suboptimal in that situation because the air flow is going to be compromised so i think that's uh, what it is but i am sure that when you prescribe an inhaler to a child especially now there's so much myth and so many taboos around the inhaler that when you are specially prescribing it to a child there is a lot of resistance so how do you overcome that resistance especially you know how do you tell the parent because they think that okay uh, you know giving an inhaler means child is asthmatic and if the child is asthmatic oh, oh my god that's a taboo that's a taboo in india So, Doctor Deepthi, what is your experience with that? Yes, ma'am. So uh, again, I uh, give them a small uh, uh, question before uh, I prescribe them. So, what I ask them is, uh, if this was a skin disease, would you have preferred a ointment or a oral drug? And uh, wow. invariably, they say an ointment, and then they understand what I mean when I am trying to use an inhaler. and i tell them that uh, that is the exact reason why i prefer an inhaler in a child where i am assured that the drug is going directly to the lung it is not going to give any side effects to your child even in the long term and uh, usually uh, not all visas are asthma so uh, that is another thing that i tell them that uh, it is not necessary that if the patient is coming with wheezing this is asthma so we can always uh, evaluate them uh, in uh, for every follow up and find out how they are responding to the treatment and you know uh, if it is asthma then again there is no better option than an inhaler so uh, for a long term asthmatic uh, if this does turn out to be asthma then uh, you know uh, it is better they are tuned to accept an inhaler uh, better so th that is how uh, we try to convince uh, the parents of uh, the child right right uh, so with that doctor Pravin, I'll come back to you with a nebulizer-related question again. So, uh, you know, in your talk, you were talking about uh, nebulizers being. Uh, you very categorically mentioned that they, you know, they're used in hospital care settings, and uh, even in the video, it was demonstrated how to clean. But I think that was very specific to uh, the nebulizer being used at home, right? And uh, like you mentioned in your talk, that of course, I think in a healthcare setting, nebulizer is something that is often shared. amongst the multiple people even if the uh, mask of course is uh, you know uh, it interfaces patient specific however the device probably is 
shared in the hospital for multiple people at the same time. So is there any specific care in terms of cleanliness other than changing the filter? Because the filter is not changed every day, of course. So is there any specific precautions that we have to take so as to, you know, avoid spread of infections and all that? Yeah. So uh, it's very important question as all uh, doctors and even uh, paramedics should uh, understand the um, the mode of uh, this nebulization therapy and what can uh, uh, it lead to if it is not given with uh, 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 in infection isolation rooms. So it should be preferably done in uh, uh, airborne infection uh, isolation rooms if possible uh, in negative pressure rooms if patient is infectious. And uh, as as I work in uh, uh, a big uh, group of TB hospital in Mumbai, so we have a lot of uh, a sputum positive or sputum negative tuberculosis post TB patients who require nebulization round the clock. So such patients, we uh, take them to uh, uh, veranda with open windows and uh, give nebulization. Uh, and we have one dedicated uh, room for. Uh, an induced sputum where we give hypertonic uh, saline for inducing sputum and coll collecting sputum for gene expert and various microbiological testings and a sharing nebulization is absolutely not uh, recommended and that has been seen in uh, uh, some hospitals so hospitals and healthcare facilities should preferably use a, a, a single use nebulization nebulization unit and they should uh, work on all these protocols and uh, 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 whatever, uh, whosoever is a healthcare worker looking after those patients, they should wear uh, all protective gears, uh, including mask, gloves, if possible, cap and glasses. So uh, uh, these are the uh, uh, infectious control policies I think we should uh, follow when we give nebulization therapy in wards or in hospital or uh, in ICUs. Right. So I think that single use nebulization units, you mean one unit for each patient. Right. 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 Any other uh, comments on this? Uh, yeah, Ma'am, uh, Dr. Krishna has another uh, special mention for a drug. Uh, he would like to uh, uh, mention about uh, nebulized Ambroxol, which was available 20 years back uh, via through CIPLA. So I think Sir uh, finds that... Uh, that it also needs a special mention here. Yeah. So by uh, we still use this uh, nebulization as we learned from uh, uh, old school teachers. So it works uh, uh, really well. So Ambroxol thirty, I think thirty milligram of respules are available. Uh, but as we uh, get uh, N-acetylcysteine in market, so we stopped using uh, Ambroxol and we are using more hypotonic saline and N-acetylcysteine. Right, absolutely. So I think sir has some more uh, comments. Uh, sir, have I missed out of any of your comments, Krishna sir? You have written, uh, there are four in total. Uh, have I, I hope I have not missed out of any of your comments, uh, please. So I think uh, uh, maybe we can continue for 10 more minutes if everybody agrees. It's already 9.48, I think, in my watch. If all of you are okay, we'll probably take a few more uh, questions. Uh, there are still questions coming in. Thank you, Ajay, sir, for your very active participation. Sir is asking if two nebulizations are given, that is Budicot, ICS, and uh, another bronchodilator, is there any rationale of giving beta-2 agonist first before giving the ICS? So I am not going to ask you, Dr. Praveen. I ask you questions in various way about nebulization. Dr. Bhaskar or Dr. Dikti, would you want to take this? Dr. Dikti, please. So there is a rationale for using a beta-2 agonist first and then a steroid, mainly because uh, the uh, beta-2 agonist uh, can act at the medium size, up to the medium-sized airways. That is where the smooth muscle is there. So and that is where it needs to act. Whereas a steroid has to go all, all the way till the alveoli. So it is better we use a bronchodilator, a beta-2 agonist first and ensure that the drug delivery of the steroid will reach the airway, uh, alveoli. So that is the rationale of using a beta-2 agonist first and then uh, the steroid. Right, perfectly, perfectly said. Uh, Dr. Bhaskar, I'll come back to you for one question. 
you're talking about nebulite uh, you know uh, bronchodilators per se so is there any subgroup because i think we very often come across prescriptions where somebody has prescribed nebulizer to a patient to be taken at home so what is that subgroup of patients where you prefer nebulized inhalation therapy as opposed to you know a uh, a uh, pmd avid spacer or maybe a breath attenuated device uh, is there any subgroup which is specifically doing fairer or better in terms with the uh, nebulized what i think especially neurological patients who the, in old days when they developed some sort of neurological problem and they have poor hand mouth con coordination things then these subgroup of patients or sometimes when there is very severe disease severe bronchospasm and severe patient is not getting admitted in hospital then the drug because of the larger doses are needed then i think in these subgroup of patient it's better to go for home nebulization sorry uh, yes yeah. absolutely i think very uh, well said and um, uh, with that uh, my last question to dr praveen and then i think uh, if we don't get any further questions from the audience then maybe after which we'll maybe just take the concluding uh, we'll probably have time for the concluding remarks or we still have questions from the audience so not really my last question but again dr praveen you also talked about you know the ventilator uh, giving nebulized uh drugs with while the patient is on ventilators and i think we all encounter that in our day to day practice so is there any specific ventilatory settings that the patient should be on while he is being nebulized yeah yeah this is very important question because we mostly we give uh, all this nebulization and nebulized drugs in icu every uh, uh, third patient in icu will be on uh, nebulized medications so when you used this nebulization in ventilatory settings when whether patient is intubated with mechanical ventilation or patient is on uh, non ventilated uh, non intubated uh, uh, ventilation so whenever possible uh, it, uh, preferably use volume controlled uh, ventilatory settings or volume control modes and we need to give a, a optimum tidal volume of more than 500 or uh, at least minimum 500 ml keep a longer inspiratory time at least uh, inspiratory time inspiratory and expiratory time ratio should be 1s to 1 if permissible and uh, the uh, the uh, longer duty cycle is required from uh, 0.3 to 0.5 uh, uh, seconds and uh, respiratory rate should be around at, uh, 12 to 18 uh, uh, per minute if it is more then we'll, uh, then there won't be a good uh, a lung deposition of the drug and optimum peep is very important so uh, we'll have to keep a peep of minimum a minimum of 5 mm or uh, you can go up to 10 mm if required and a short acting uh, uh, what do you call a sedatives are very important when you administer nebulizer if patient is not synchronized with ventilator and you are giving nebulizer there's no use so uh, a better synchrony of patient with ventilator is required and if if prefer preferable if you are giving antibiotics or if you are giving nebulization in ventilator patient use a mesh nebulizer if it is available otherwise jet nebulizer is uh, okay and again a nebulization the the site of nebulizer is very important when you uh, even i have uh, uh, we have already discussed in in the talk so uh, the site of uh, nebulizer it should be at least 15 cm away from that y or if it is put away away from that y circuit in the inspiratory uh, limb if it is an expiratory limb there is no use of that nebulization if and if it is if it uh, if uh, uh, you are not like if there are some contraindications you can put it it actually near the et tube and maybe around 10 to 15 cm from the et tube and when you are using in uh, niv patients uh, you will have to put a uh, just ahead of the mask and if you can uh, remove that uh, niv and put them on mask nebulizer or uh, with mouthpiece then that will be great if uh, not tolerating then you can continue nebulization on niv itself right also some ventilators have a different uh, specific port for nebulizer so i think uh, sometimes people also tend to use that port 
डॉक्टर विशाल फ्रॉम महाराष्ट्र मुंबई इज आस्किंग विच बीटा टू एगोनेस्ट नेबलाइजेशन इज यूज इन ड्रग रेजिस्टेंट टीबी पेशेंट विद एक्सर्वेशन डॉक्टर भास्कर वुड यू वॉन्ट टू आंसर दैट वॉट इज द प्रेफर्ड बीटा टू एगोनेस्ट नेबलाइजर ड्रग विच इज यूज इन ड्रग रेजिस्टेंट टीबी पेशेंट हु प्रेजेंट टू यू विद इन एक्सर्वेशन See if it's uh, exacerbation, then I think in it, especially levosol short acting saba would be preferred. Saba or we can and nowadays formitrol is also available in nebulization and formitrol. We know it says uh, duration of action of five minutes. Oh, uh, onset of action in five minutes. So definitely solbutamol, levosolbutamol, these uh, saba we, will be preferred in case of exacerbation. Uh, I think there is no any. Uh, or i don't know any th- th- drug is specific with tb there is any means association with tb tuberculosis the treatment will be same yeah rightly said as most of the patients with uh, 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 extensive pulmonary disease uh, with uh, mdr uh, tb uh, sometimes they come with uh, hypoxia that and uh, tachycardia so a uh, better to use levosolbutamol as we have duolin uh, which is currently in the market and uh, as uh, sir rightly said uh, formotrol can be used with the combination of budesonide if required uh and uh, you have anticholinergic salts so you can use ipratropium bromide as a a short uh, acting beta uh, short acting muscarinic agent but may i also add the importance of cleaning the device after that because that uh, then again uh, it's a drtb patient so uh, better to clean the device or make sure that it is their individual uh, personalized uh, device so right. those, uh, that point is important another um, uh, if i may uh, dr shivani uh dr krishna sir has a very interesting uh, point here uh patients proudly tell us uh, when they visit that we have a nebulizer as if they have a elephant as a pet in their house uh, at home and that we can use it any time so i tell them that buying a nebulizer and when to use it are two different uh, things so uh, if you're settled with an mdi or a dpi then you never even need to use it so yes that's uh, important yeah absolutely i think one thing which has actually stood out for me at least in this webinar is that krishna sir has been extremely actively participating i'm sure he participates and act, is quite active on all webinars but this one at least for me and sir uh, you have been the most active participant of this webinar and i would, uh, I would have actually loved it if he had come personally and told it because i i, I don't think i said it the right way <laughs> no i i'm i'm sure you did dr deepthi and i was actually about to request sir if he would want to come online right. for us and since this was idea is completely his brain child and he's worked very hard even in coordinating with the sipla team to make all the uh, videos a few of which we did not play at the beginning and we we'll maybe play at the end so maybe we play the videos and then do the take home messages if that's okay but with that before that i'd like to add one small point about uh, giving inhaled corticosteroids in tuberculosis whether it is drug resistant or drug sensitive i don't think that's recommended so budesonide is something that we have to use with great caution when we are treating patients with tuberculosis presenting in an exacerbation so i think that's um, one thing that i wanted to add uh, there's another one very in- interesting question left which is about the uh, smart inhalers which i will actually come back maybe after the videos are played and uh, come back to you dr deepthi for that and after that i think we can all conclude so i would please request the technical team to play the uh, remaining videos would, which which would actually be the rota inhaler the sip inhaler the synchro breath and uh, I, i mean these are the important ones that we want to be played which we could not really play at the beginning This is a nasal spray. Today I'm going to tell you how to use it correctly. Priming is important when you're using a nasal spray for the first time or if the spray hasn't been used for several days. How do you prime a nasal spray? Shake the bottle gently for 10 seconds, remove the dust cap from the spray, hold the bottle upright with two fingers on the shoulders of the spray pump and your thumb on the bottom of the bottle. 
repeat pumping action once you see a fine mist your nasal spray is ready to use first blow your nose gently to clear the passageways step 2 now close one of the nostrils using your finger and slightly tilt your head forward step 3 keep the bottle upright and carefully insert the tip of the nozzle in the other nostril breathe in and use your index and middle fingers to squeeze the pump to release a spray step 4 remove the bottle from the nostril and breathe out if two sprays are recommended in one nostril repeat the previous steps in the same nostril if a second dose is recommended for your other nostril repeat the steps again after using the nasal spray wipe the nozzle with a clean cloth or tissue and replace the protective dust cap here are some important instructions for you clean your nasal spray at least once a week to clean your nasal spray, soak the nozzle and dust cap in a bowl of warm water for a few minutes. Now, rinse both under clean running water and allow them to air dry. Never try to unblock the nozzle using a pin or any other sharp object. Do not allow any other person to use your nasal spray. For more information on product, refer the pack, insert or log on to breathefree.com. or you can call on 987 333 Hello everyone. Today in this video, I'm going to tell you how to correctly measure your lung function. That is PEFR, peak expiratory flow rate using this device a breathometer. Let's get started. A breathometer has the following parts, a mouthpiece, pointer, slot and a scale. First join the mouthpiece to the breathometer. Now move the pointer along the slots towards the mouthpiece till it doesn't move any further. Next hold the breathometer so that the fingers are away from the scale and the slot. Do not cover the holes at the end of the breathometer. I suggest you take the reading while standing up. First, take a deep breath. Then place the mouthpiece of a breathometer in your mouth between the teeth, but do not bite it. Keep your lips closed firmly around the mouthpiece. Blow out just once as hard and as fast as you can, just like you blow out candles on your birthday. As you blow out, the pointer moves ahead on the scale depending on your lung health. Note down your reading. Repeat the step twice to obtain three readings. The highest of three readings is your PEFR. Breathometer is also a useful tool in self or home monitoring. Consult your doctor to know more about home monitoring. Here are some important instructions that you must keep in mind. First. Do not cough or spit into the breathometer as it may affect the reading. If you happen to cough or spit while taking the reading, it is recommended to take a new reading. Second, never drop the breathometer as it may affect the precision of the device. For more information on product, refer the pack insert or log on to breathefree.com or you can call on 987-333-5577 Hi! Let's see how to use a mini Zerostat spacer with a pressurized meter dose inhaler. The mini Zerostat spacer has parts like inhalation chamber, mouthpiece cap, mouthpiece, slot to put in the inhaler. Take your inhaler and open the mouthpiece cap. Give the inhaler a good shake. Insert the inhaler into the slot provided in the mini Zerostat spacer. Exhale completely. Remove the cap from the spacer, place the mouthpiece in your mouth and seal your lips around it. 
press down the inhaler's canister to release a dose of medicine into the spacer. Inhale slowly and deeply. Take the spacer out of your mouth and hold your breath a count of 10 or as long as you're comfortable. Then breathe out normally or alternatively keep your lips firmly close around the mouthpiece and continue to breathe normally three to five times. Remember to take one dose at a time. If you need a second dose, wait for a minute and then repeat earlier steps. After taking each dose, rinse your mouth with water and spit it out. That's it. That's all you need to know to use Mini ZeroStat correctly. Cleaning instructions and information. Remove the inhaler from the spacer. Soak the spacer in a mild soap solution for 15 minutes and gently stir it. Take out the spacer, shake off the soapy water and rinse it with clean water. Shake out any excess water and allow the spacer to air dry in a vertical position, preferably overnight, before returning to its container. Replace the mini ZeroStat spacer with the new one after using it for 6 months. For more information on product, refer pack insert or log on to breathefree.com or you can call on 987 333-55-77 Hello! <laughs> Let's find out how to use a rotahaler. It's a widely used product in India. It's a simple process. You only need to remember is insert rotate and inhale. Rotahela consists of these parts a mouthpiece, a rotor cap hole, fin and base. Let's get going. Start by inserting the rotor cap into the square hole with the transparent end facing downwards. Now press the rotor cap firmly until it's level with the top of the hole. Hold the mouthpiece with one hand and firmly rotate the base. You'll notice the fin separating the rotor cap into two parts, visible through the clear rotor haler. Voila, it's ready to use. Sit straight or stand upright. Breathe out fully through your mouth. Place the mouthpiece of the rotor haler between your teeth and close your lips tightly around it. Tilt your head slightly backward. Inhale rapidly and deeply as you can. Remove the rotahaler from your mouth and hold the breath for just about 10 seconds or as long as you are comfortable. And then breathe out normally. If you find some powder still left inside the rotahaler, repeat the above procedure to take a second inhalation. If another dose is required, insert a new rotor cap into the rotor cap hole. This will push out the empty rotor cap remaining in the rotor cap hole. Repeat the same steps as mentioned earlier and put the two halves of the rotor haler back together after getting rid of the empty rotor caps. That's it. Wasn't it simple? Hmm? <laughs> insert, rotate and inhale. Important instructions. After taking each dose, rinse your mouth with water and spit it out. Clean the rotor haler at least once a week. Separate the two halves of rotor haler and rinse it in clean running water. Shake well to remove the excess water and leave it to air dry. It is recommended to use a new rotor haler every six months. For more information on product refer pack insert or log on to breathefree.com. Or you can call on 987 333 Swati, there is nothing much to worry about your health. I have prescribed you Sip Haler. Start using it as advised and your disease will be controlled. But 
doctor, I have never used this device before. Um, I guess it will take me some time to learn how to use it. No, not at all. I recommend Sip Halo to many of my patients because it is so easy to use. Really? Using Sip Halo is as easy as a snap. It's a simple and agile process designed around ease of usage and patient convenience. Let me show you how to use it and you will also agree. It is as easy as a snap. To take your dose, follow three simple steps. Open, load, inhale and you're done. The snap. Hold the sip hailer in one hand like this. Always make sure that the sip hailer is in a horizontal position. Place the thumb of your other hand on this thumb grip. Open the sip hailer by sliding the thumb grip as far as it goes till the top opens. Just an easy flip to open the device. Hold the sip hailer with the mouthpiece towards you. Slide this lever as far as it goes to load the device. And now your sip hailer is ready for use. Really? It's that simple? Yes, but remember, every time the lever is pushed back, a dose is made available for inhalation. The number on the dose counter window will now be reduced by one. Now exhale fully through your mouth for as long as it is comfortable to you. Remember, never breathe into your Siphela mouthpiece. Now place the mouthpiece in your mouth and close your lips tightly around it. You can sit or stand, but remain in an upright position and keep your head straight. Now you're ready to inhale through your mouth. Inhale quickly and deeply. Now remove the sip inhaler and hold your breath for about 10 seconds or for as long as it is comfortable to you. Now breathe out slowly. To close the sip inhaler, put your thumb on the thumb grip and slide the thumb grip towards you till you hear a click sound. This makes your sip inhaler ready to use again the next time. After inhalation, always remember to rinse your mouth with water and spit it out. Make sure you don't swallow it. And if another dose is required, repeat the same steps. Open, load, inhale. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ramesh. It is simple and convenient to use, just like you promised. Yes, that's how easy and convenient it is to use this inhaler. Like a snap. Simple to open, simple to load the dose, simple to inhale through the mouthpiece. For correct frequency and use, always consult your doctor. If you need any more help to understand the use of Siphela, get in touch with our Breathe Free Digital Educators. Hi, today I'm going to show you how to use Synchro Breathe, the new generation inhaler. If your doctor has prescribed you Synchro Breathe, you simply need to understand how to use it and we will help you to do just that. All you have to remember is click, click, click. First, shake your Synchro Breathe, keeping the mouthpiece cover closed. Then open it by gently pulling the cover down and there we have the first click. Exhale as much as you can before you put the Synchro Breathe in your mouth and start breathing slowly and deeply through the mouthpiece. You'll then hear the second click indicating that the medicine is being released. But keep in mind to continue inhaling even after the second click. When you're done, remove the single breath from your mouth. And hold your breath for 10 seconds or as long as comfortable and then breathe out slowly through your nose. After that, close the mouthpiece cover and that's the final third click. Always remember, after using the inhaler, rinse your mouth with water and make sure you don't swallow it. If you need another puff, follow the same click, click, click process. And that's how easy it is to use Synchro Breathe. All you have to remember is click, 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 click to open, 
Click to inhale. Click to close. Do consult your doctor on frequency and use. There are a lot of questions that come up when it comes to inhalers. Let me give you some information on the top 5 frequently asked questions on Synchro Breathe. How do I know how many doses remain in my Synchro Breathe? <laughs> synchro Breathe comes with an integrated dose counter which moves at the interval of 20 puffs. When the last 40 puffs are remaining, the color of the dose counter ring changes from green to red, indicating that only a few doses are remaining. And you need to arrange for a new device. When the dose counter displays zero, it's time to discard your Synchro Breathe. After zero, do not use the device since it does not contain the required amount of medicine. Why is there a notch at the back of my Synchro Breathe? The notch is a dose release button at the back of a Synchro Breathe, right below the dose counter. The button helps in test firing the device. The test firing of Synchro Breathe should be done on two occasions. First, when you're using the device for the first time, and second, if you haven't used it for a week or more. In order to test fire Synchro Breathe, you need to release two puffs into the air. First, shake the inhaler and open the mouthpiece cover. Then fire the test dose to release the first puff into the air by pushing down the notch. Close the mouthpiece cover. Repeat these steps to release the second puff. And remember, do not use the dose release button for inhaling the medicine. I get a medicinal taste in my mouth after using Synchro Breathe. Is there a reason for concern? Yeah, sometimes you get a bitter taste after use of Synchro Breathe, which is absolutely normal. Some amount of medicine may remain at the back of the throat. You can just rinse your mouth and gargle. And remember, do not swallow. What if I accidentally open the mouthpiece cover and do not take inhaler? Will there be any medicine loss? Don't worry. If you accidentally open the inhaler, there will be no medicine loss. Just close the mouthpiece cover immediately. The Synchro Breathe only releases a dose of medicine when you place the mouthpiece in your mouth and inhale through it. However, it is important to open the mouthpiece cover gently to avoid accidental release of a dose. How do I appropriately clean and store my Synchro Breathe? Clean your Synchro Breathe once a week by opening the mouthpiece and wiping with a dry cloth or tissue. You should not wash your Synchro Breathe with water. Always keep it dry. There it is. For more information, consult your doctor. And when it comes to using the Synchro Breathe inhaler, just remember, click, click, click. Click to open. Click to inhale. Click to close. If you need any more help on how to use the inhaler, get in touch with our Breathe Free Digital Educators. So I think uh, it has been a great learning experience even for me so far. But also in terms of this uh, breaking all exceptions, I think Krishna sir has actually agreed to come online, and, which I have really wanted. And this actually, I think I have requested him for all the webinars that have been his ideas, but sir rarely ever does it. And today seems to be that rare occasion that we finally convince sir to, you know, come online for a minute. So. Sir, I would first, uh, you know, hand over to you to please convey your message. Thank you so much from all of us for coming online. Uh, can you hear me all? Uh, so actually, basically, a director's job is to only focus on direction. You shouldn't try to become an actor. And uh, this platform, CCA, was never created to showcase myself or to boost myself or to ma make myself a star. A director is someone who creates many superstars. He never makes himself a superstar. So I avoid hugely coming to the webinars, although I indulge uh, completely in them, including the topic selection or everything. But however, a director should be preferred off the screen and not on the screen. But because uh, having two lovely bands here, Shivani and uh, Deepti and uh, two lovely bhais here, 
Ravi Bhaskar and uh, Pravin Tavre. I had to come here. So basically, this webinar was conducted for the only one reason and running till this time now at 10.15 to make Shivani awake after 9.30 p.m. also. That is my main intention. Okay, she sleeps over 9.30. So I saw, let me try that let her be awake after 9.30 also. So all those videos, so when they were playing, I could I was observing Shivani's face. She was like dizzy and uh, so my first intention was that. Second is the simplest thing, the simplest thing, it may look like regarding inhalation. But I troubled Sipla just in a week span, they should create all these videos. And I am very sure that the Praveen Tower and Ravi Bhaskar are looking at the model more than the devices. The model was excellent, no model who presented those. Yeah, okay, I am very sure. Uh, but however, Shivani and Deepthi look elegant than the model. But uh, had I been ever known this, that they will be getting in a model, my idea was to do it via some person. Then I would have recommended your name to them. However, this webinar went very well, fantastic. The ultimate thing which I would like to deliver to people is very important. Whenever there comes a matter of cardiac illness or uh, you have some uh, kidney illness or you have some uh, liver illness, whatever you have. So when nephrology comes, when cardiology comes, when hepatology comes, no questions. When pulmonology comes, there are many questions. Why this? Sir, uh, will I become addicted for this? Will this become habituated to me? Sir, uh, at this small age, should I start taking this? So we have a lot of queries from the people. Actually, this webinar should not only reach the pulmonologist, but also to the common people. And you people have covered it so brilliantly that this webinar I insist SIPLA to bring it on open for everyone, everyone in the common people sector, the layman people should see this webinar. That is very important. Why? Because no, I tell you, as I have already heard from the Shivani and uh, um, Deepthi, that when you think of uh, application regarding an ointment or cream for a skin disease, nobody asks them any question. For an ear drop, no question. For an eye drop, no question. But only the question arises when you prescribe inhaler. And more so, I would guide you all, everyone watching here now, the 1300 plus. I will not tell that they are live watching me now here. They were registered and 1300 registered. I am not telling that live 1300 people are watching now. However, the YouTube channel will be uploaded. But remember this very important aspect to be covered to them. You should initially tell them, convince them before writing. You just write it and if they don't buy, it doesn't make any meaning. So you should tell them. And when they go and purchase the medicines from the chemist, no, the chemist will hand over a bag like this. See, look at the, my hands, a bag like this. They will be afraid that they have to swallow so much of drugs. So before the patient leaves your table, tell them that what you see that huge bag is not all that you are swallowing. There are unswallowable other way of drugs that are getting there prescribed to you. There is a mask for you. There is a spacer for you. There is a INCS, uh, internal corticosteroid for you. There is an MDA for you. There is a device for you, uh, spacer. There is a DPA for you. There is a device for you. So do not think that you are swallowing that whole bag of drug and run off. It is very essential to tell them. Very essential. See, what we prescribe oral are very minimal. Every uh, pulmonologist as such. At the max, we may prescribe three to four tablets. But however, the carrying bag of buying it looks huge. That panics the patient. That is very important. At least, at least a doctor before leaving, uh, the patient leaves uh, the consultation, should tell them, do not be panicked. They will give you a huge bag, but you will not be swallowing everything. That is very important. That is my take-home message. And uh, before uh, I uh, 
conclude so that you all can conclude with the message i would like to thank for a brilliant presentation from deepti and pravin tavre thank you so much for the brilliant presentation shivani my lovely bahan is always great and great but uh, she being awake at this moment is also very great ravi bhaskar you did a brilliant job thank you so much team sipla one week i troubled you huge to create these uh, videos and however uh, it was a great job that you did it thank you so much thank you cc and sipla everyone jai shri krishna go ahead shivani thank you sir thank you again for coming online and enlightening us further your uh, messages that you've been giving all through the talk actually have been extremely insightful even for us so uh, i would really like to thank you to conceptualize this topic i think it has gone brilliantly well and uh, i am actually honestly not sleepy i'm going to call you after the webinar and speak to you for some time so i'm absolutely not sleepy today and it's because the topic and the discussion has been extremely interesting so thank you sir so with that one last quick question to dr deepthi about smart inhalers i think the discussion is going to be incomplete if we don't talk about it. yeah so it was while uh, uh, when i got this topic and i was reading about it that uh, i got to know about smart inhalers not yet uh, uh, in india but uh, it is something to really look forward to so the device is the pro air uh, digihaler and uh, it has a sensor which uh, detects uh, not only the number of doses uh, which the patient has taken just like a do dose counter but it also tells the time and the date of use as well as the location where the patient has taken that uh, uh, drug so how it is going to help is uh, number one whether they are taking it on time whether uh, the patient is regular with his medication and number two is uh, it can help to detect any triggers so uh, depending on uh, you know which place they have been uh, you know forced to take that inhaler they can uh, work up on the uh, trigger uh, which uh, could have led to the exacerbation so all this is also uh, uh, done in such a way that the information goes to the doctor who has prescribed that dg inhaler so again it is going to help the doctor also work up on the patient and makes his job easier so apart from that there are high advanced uh, uh, inhalers which even remind the patient to take uh, the drug so it is giving alarm uh, to the patient that you have forgotten your drug and you are supposed to take an inha inhalation so uh, i think it's uh, something very unique and something to look forward to yeah uh... sorry i think i was on mute uh, so i think the only thing is that maybe we have one from zydus a uh, smart inhaler in terms of that it actually is connected to cloud and it tells you that uh, you know if the patient has actually taken the dose or not take uh, missed the dose so i think we actually have one from zydus i'm not sure if it's still in the market or it has been withdrawn but there was definitely one from uh, zydus which was there um, um, i'm sorry i've had to actually uh, had some technical issues so i've had to log uh, out and i've logged in from another device so i think there may be a technical glitch there with that i think i would really like to conclude uh, i am extremely thankful to all the audience who have stayed logged in till this hour uh, my special thanks to of course krishna sir and uh, uh my extremely patient and understanding panelist who uh, actually did bear a lot with me all through the webinar i would bother them one last time for concluding remarks and dr bhaskar can i please start with you about the concluding remarks what i think ki consistent and current consistent and correct inhalational uses is the only thing which significantly improves the quality of life and reduces the risk of exacerbation so the patient awareness is of great importance when we talk about inhalers this is my take home message right thank you dr deepthi uh, i would uh, really uh, request all uh, consultants pulmonologists and physicians to please follow up their patient on about how they are using how many times they are using the demo take a demo every time uh, the patient comes because uh, the more the confident they are about the use there are there is a tendency to skip the uh, steps 
they may skip the breath holding step they may skip the gargling step so it is uh, really important that every follow up the inhaler device is uh, a demo is taken they are asked whether uh, you know they are uh, gargling are they uh, do doing the breath hold so and then also review about any side effects uh, or any other issues they are facing so every visit the follow up uh, about the inhaler device is my take home message right hello am i audible yes 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 dr, yes, dr. pradeep your message please yeah so uh, uh, my final message will be always involve your patient in your uh, uh, treatment or therapy uh, let them understand what you are thinking and uh, uh, let them uh, be cured from whatever they are suffering from that's it right so i think our take home message for today i am just summarizing what all my panelists have said that of course we need to reiterate the technique uh the science behind taking inhalers to the patients repeatedly also uh, i think that is something that uh, has a lot of value and uh, improves compliance enormously and uh, with that i think i would conclude today's webinar it has been an extremely learning experience and enlightening experience even for me and uh, i am definitely it has definitely also kept me awake i would like to again thank dr krishna sir for conceptualizing this giving us this platform um of course i would also like to thank dr narayana pradeep who is the backbone of cci he is also always there to guide us to enlighten us dr uh, anil maske dr ashish dubey dr vijay kumar chennam chetty dr atri dr kirat dr ravi dosi and everybody else who goes behind putting up a great show week after week for over 4 years it has been a phenomenal success and with that i uh, extend again a very warm thank you to team sipla especially vipul ji for doing the videos for us at such short notice and such beautiful videos and of course for providing us the platform the technical team for flawless connectivity always doing this so smooth and bearing with us for such extended hours so and last but not the least the audience for being with us till 10:30 i am sure it is way past everybody's bedtime by now and i am extremely thankful for everybody for being here and my dear dear panelists thanks again thanks a lot everybody and with that good night night thank you yeah. thank you thank you